Good evening and warm welcome to all of you. On behalf of Roja Muthiya Research Library, it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Suresh Balakrishnan and all the guests. Today, Mr. Suresh will be delivering his lecture, Early Northern and the Indian National Struggle. This lecture is arranged as part of Prof. M. Anandakrishnan Endowment Lecture Series. Before the lecture, I would like to take a couple of minutes to say a few words about the Roja Muthiya Research Library. The Roja Muthiya Research Library was founded in 1994 to preserve, catalog and expand the collection of Roja Muthiya, a private collector who put together one of the world's finest private libraries of Tamil publication during his lifetime. Aramaral currently houses one of the most unique collection of Tamil imprints in South Asia. Some of the publications date from the later part of the 18th century. With a collection of 4 lakh items, Aramaral provides research materials and facilities for research scholars of Tamil studies in a variety of fields spanning the humanities, social sciences and sciences. Before the lecture, I would like to give a brief introduction about today's speaker. Mr. Suresh Balakrishnan is an advocate and author of a few books. His book, Early Norton, a biography in two volumes was recently published. His early books, earlier books include Famous Judges and Lawyers of Madras in 2012. He has edited a book called Lives of Chief Justice of Madras, containing selected writings of V. N. Srinivasarao, an eminent legal historian. Now, may I invite Mr. Suresh Balakrishnan to deliver his lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be invited to give this uh, Professor Ananda Krishnan Endowment Lecture. My association with uh, R.M. Arul goes back to 10 years ago when I first did my research for my first book. Um, today I am going to speak about Eardley Norton and his work in the Indian national struggle. Now, essential to an understanding of Eardley Norton's personality and uh, his attitude towards Indian political aspiration, it is necessary that we understand his father's personality. His father, John Bruce Norton, first came to Madras with his father, Sir John David Norton, who was newly appointed as a judge of the old Supreme Court of Madras, that was then the Supreme Court of Madras. Sir John David Norton's tenure as a Supreme Court judge was brief. He only lived in Madras for, for about two years and he died at sea when he had when he went to recover his health. John Bruce Norton, although he had lived only for two years by then, continued to live in Madras. And uh, he became quite a prominent citizen of Madras, a distinguished barrister. He went on to become an advocate general. And he also associated himself with certain public forces, especially native education. In those days, Indians were called natives, it would be a very interesting exercise for anybody interested in Indian political history to find out when this term native ceased to be in vogue because it has a certain significance. If you refer to Indians as natives, you are referring to them as native dwellers of a huge subcontinent. If you are referring to Indians as Indians, then you are referring to them as a people who have an identity and in later, in later decades of people having a national identity. John Bruce Norton was uh, closely associated with the Pachapa institutions. He was a patron of the Pachapa institutions and his annual lectures came to be noted as one of the annual events. He was also closely associated with another Norton called George Norton who obtained the sanction of the Supreme Court of Pachapa's will. Now this George Norton was also Advocate General, a barrister, he was also Advocate General and he was also associated with the promotion of native education but George Norton was not a relative of the this Norton lineage, Sir John David Norton, his son John Bruce Norton and his son Erdie Norton, George Norton was related to this, these Nortons. John Bruce Norton lived in Madras and uh, he was also a friend of uh, the Indian princes. He was chiefly responsible for the Tanju royal family uh, recovering the property which was annexed due to the act of spoliation at the time of uh, Lord Dalhousie's regime. And uh, until the time he was remembered, John Bruce Norton was known for his uh, benefactions and his uh, work in especially 
in promoting native education. He was concerned about the political rights of Indians, and it was his philosophy that that has that the devolution of political rights had to come only gradually. We must so time must ripen, posterity must reap. He said in one of his Pachapas uh, institution lectures, and that sowed the seed for his sons, his eldest son, Early Norton's political philosophy. Early Norton was born in Madras on 19 February 1852, and he lived in Madras for 10 years. And then in 1862, he and his brother Robert were sent to Brussels for education, for, to start their school career. He didn't undergo formal schooling until the age of 10. And from Brussels, Early Norton went to Asia in England, and from Asia, he went to Rugby, a famous public school in England, where the four years, four years he spent gave him uh, some of the happiest memories to cherish. And from there, he went to Merton College, Oxford, from where four years later, he graduated as a Bachelor of Arts. And then he worked for a while in London as a journalist. During that time, I was called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn. And uh, he started practicing as a barrister in England, in Oxford Circuit. And he was also his father's junior in a few cases before the Privy Council. The word junior, in, with reference to barristers, is not understood in the same way as a junior is understood in, in, in India. He was not a junior in the sense that a junior uh, helping a senior, a junior barrister is a junior who is instructed with a senior, he gets a proportion of the fees given to the senior counsel. His English career, his, uh, his career at the English bar failed to take off. And that was also the time when this was about 1878-1879. That was also the time when he got married and uh, he became a, the father of a son. And uh, he had to, he was compelled to make a living. And his father, John Bruce Norton, urged him to go to Madras, where once John Bruce Norton was uh, advocate general. And uh, by this time, I must, I must have told you before that by this time, John Bruce Norton had returned to London. He wound up his residence and practice in India and uh, gone back to London and he was practicing before the Privy Council. And he urged his son, Early Norton, to go to Madras and where the father's name might help him get speedy work. So reluctantly, with a heavy heart, Early Norton left all the near and dear ones, what he called home, and came to Madras. He, he, from the way he felt at the time, he was not returning to Madras, but going away to Madras. Madras was a kind of foreign land, near alien place, because he only had some childhood and early boyhood memories of this city. Although this was the city of his birth, he felt no special affinity for this place. It is not even right to say that he was disoriented, because you can't even say any kind of a orientation had taken place. So reluctantly, about the a ship called Navarino, he sailed for Madras and reached Madras in July 1879. No sooner that his arrival, he entered the Madras bar. Next year, he became coroner of Madras. The scope of today's speech forbids us to look deeper into those activities. The early years at the Madras bar, his work as a coroner. And uh, during that period, when he was a, the coronership was a part-time employment. So. He occupied his mornings and evenings and lived the rest of the day for his practice at the bar. He was a rising barrister in the early 80s until 1886. During that time, a national movement, which you all know, called the Indian National Congress, was started in 1885 in Bombay. And uh, Norton was not one of the first members or founder members of the Congress. If anywhere you read, read on the internet that he was one of the founders, it is incorrect information. He first joined the Congress in Madras in 1887. And the Madras Congress of 1887, it, it was but natural that he was attracted to the Congress because he had inherited his, uh, his political philosophy, the attitude towards Indians and their political rights from his father. Uh, and in the 1887 Madras Congress, he spoke of the second day. That Congress in his story is memorable for two reasons. Someone had called him a veiled seditionist for associating himself with the International Congress. And he gave a strong rebuttal to that charge on the second day while speaking in support of a resolution for the reform of the Indian Legislative Councils. That veiled sedition speech is a very popular, that passage is very popular. In fact, probably the most quoted of all his utterances 
and uh, anybody who has heard, heard of Ragnarok might have come across that passage. If it be sedition gentlemen to rebel against class tyranny, that's it. And the Madras Congress of 1887 is also memorable in his story for another reason. He gave a famous garden party to the delegates and other guests at his house called Dunno House. Now Dunno House was located in a place which is now called Alwar Pit. But in his days, the word Alwar Pit you don't come across anywhere. It is either referred to as located in Luz or in Tenam Pit. Probably the name Alwar Pit had not come into vogue in those days. It was quite a big garden house, and there, on 29th December 1887, to the guests, uh, he gave a exquisite party. He had arranged a kolatam dance by Notch Girls and uh, oil lamps illumined the roadways and pathways leading up to the venue and uh, some of them what spellbound the dance that took place and some of them found literary repast in his vast library and uh, after that even, even by this even after the first association with the indian national congress he had already emerged as a front rank leader and in the and in 1888 he was quite busy as a congressman in 1888 he had gone to london in connection with a couple of scandals arising from Hyderabad, uh, a couple of mining scandals. And there in London, when the, it, it, there was an inquiry before the Select Committee of the House of Commons. And when the inquiry was over and a character called Abdul Haq found guilty, with an infinite sense of relief, he turned from law to politics. Coincidentally, it happened that in London at that time, Dadabai Navroji from Bombay and W.C. Bonerji from Bengal were also present. And these three congressmen, Norton from Madras, Navroji from Bombay and Bonerji from Bengal, they met and decided to start a campaign in England for India's political rights. Now, they thought it out themselves and started it themselves. No resolution was passed in the previous 1887 Madras Congress appointing them, them or any other congressmen to undertake the campaign. And in this campaign, Norton addressed a few gatherings in different parts of England. And uh, during this campaign, when Bonerji and Norton were in Newcastle, they went out for a walk on one evening and uh, they found huge placards announcing that Charles Bradlaugh, then in Parliament, would speak at the music hall on India. That was not the first time Norton had seen Bradlaugh. He had earlier seen him about 10 years ago before the, in the, when Bradlaugh and Annie Besant defended themselves in what is known as the Fruits of Philosophy case. The Fruits of Philosophy was a pamphlet published in America advocating contraception. And Bradlaugh and Annie Besant had reissued copies of it in England. That created a furore. And uh, they were indicted before the King's Bench. And Norton, at the time a newcomer at the English bar, had watched those proceedings. And he was favorably impressed by Bradlaugh's performance in defending himself. And now, in 1888, that evening, uh, Norton and Bonerji went to music, the music hall and heard Bradlaugh. And uh, as these two people were the only people with tall hats, as you all know, the Victorian men used to wear top hats or tall, ha tall hats and they, they stood out and they were given places on the platform on either side of Bradlaugh. Bradlaugh spoke, Norton and Bonerji spoke after that and no Norton was fully impressed with Bradlaugh's sincerity and his uh, concern for India's political rights. That when he came back to London, when Bonerji and Norton came back to London and met uh, Dada by Navroji, it was Norton who mooted the idea to his Congress colleagues that they must enlist Bradlaugh's support for India. Now, in hitherto published books on the Indian National Congress, this is something which you will not find. It is well known that Bradlaugh championed India's cause in the House of Commons. That much is quite popularly known, I think. But it is not so popularly known that it was Norton who mooted the idea to his Congress colleagues. And then later that year, he returned to Madras and uh, he gave public speeches recounting their campaigning experiences. The, la the closing parts of um, 1888 also witnessed the uh, speech given by uh, the retiring Viceroy, Lord Dufferin, which created quite a sensation in a speech called the St. Andrew's Dinner Speech in Calcutta. And he made scathing remarks about the congressman's aims and methods. And it is uh, a very well-known part of the history of early history of the International Congress that Norton retorted to those remarks in an intrepid open letter to the retiring Viceroy. And later, in, in December 1888, Norton attended the Congress held at Allahabad and there he moved the public service resolution. This question had been occupying the attention of the congressmen from the beginning. The first Congress of 
1885 passed a resolution and the resolution which uh, Norton moved in this 1888 Congress demanded that simultaneous examinations should be conducted for the civil service in both England and India. In this regard, I would like to uh, draw to your attention that uh, during the course of my research, I found one very interesting argument, which I didn't make a note of actually, but I, don't, I didn't include it in the book. Very interesting argument raised against this proposal. One of them said that uh, if you hold simultaneous examinations in both England and India, taking advantage of the time difference, the students might telegraph the question paper. <laughs> so this is one of the arguments against that proposal. And, um, Norton moved that resolution and uh, an amendment was moved by Monomohan Gose, a Calcutta barrister and a good friend of Yadli Norton. And this amendment had a, has an amusing little backstory. On the day previous to the day when Norton moved the original resolution, Mohitilal Gose, the editor of Amrita Bazar Patrika, had strenuous objections to Indian students being sent to England for a two years training even if the simultaneous examinations were to take place. And uh, therefore, Monomohan Gose was asked to move an amendment. Norton happily withdrew his original motion in, and uh, the amended uh, resolution was carried unanimously. There also was a very interesting Raja Shia Prasad incident in the 1888 Congress, but today let's not go into it. The, when the 1888 Congress was over, then it was a very notable sitting in Norton's uh, memories. And uh, in 1889, in the, in, the, in the preceding parts of 1889, 1889 before the Bombay Congress, Norton became a Madras Municipal Commissioner and the 1889 Congress which was held in Bombay is remembered as the Bradlaugh Congress because Charles Bradlaugh in his first visit to India had attended that Congress. And uh, from the point of view of early Norton's contributions to India's constitutional development, this Bombay Congress of 1889 must be regarded as the most important of all the Congress sessions he had attended. Because it was in this Congress that a scheme was adopted which later metamorphosed into the Indian Council's Act of, Act of 1892. That scheme was the Madras scheme and what is not so popularly known, what is not so often or what is hardly mentioned in hitherto published books on the Indian National Congress is that that scheme, the Madras scheme was prepared under Norton's leadership in Madras. Week after week congressmen in Madras met at his house, Dunmo house and they prepared this scheme and in the subjects committee debate over the rival schemes, the three presidencies of India prepared their own schemes, Madras, Bombay and Bengal. Madras, Bombay and Bengal, they prepared their own schemes and uh, in the subjects committee debate over the rival scheme, the Madras scheme triumphed because it was bolder than the other schemes and Norton was asked to introduce it on the second day of the Congress. Sir William Wedderburn was the president of this Congress and uh, Norton introduced this scheme. Uh, the scheme embodied ele uh, election by ballots and also proportional representation uh, of minorities and he, the scheme was submitted to Bradlaugh with the request that he may be pleased to draft a bill along the lines indicated in that scheme and then uh, introduced that bill in the House of Commons in London. Bradlaugh spoke on the last day and he was very guarded in the promises he made but then true to his word he uh, he drafted a bill, I think only one month or one and a half months later, February 1890, he introduced the bill, but the bill was dropped out of the first reading and subsequently Lord Cross will introduce a second bill and by the time the 1892 Act was passed, Bradlaugh was already dead. He did not live to see the passing of the 1892 Act. In 1890, along with many other congressmen, Norton went to England to campaign for India's political rights and this time the congressmen were appointed by a resolution passed at the 1889 Bombay Congress. Norton, Surendranath Banerjee and a few others. Norton went to England in May 1890 and there he addressed gatherings in different parts of England. And uh, an amusing, amusing things that happened during this campaign is that uh, he was mistaken for Surindad Banerjee at a couple of places and in one of, one of the places he preferred to keep up the pretense until then he never disclosed that he is actually early Norton. He was happy to be known as Surindad Banerjee 
and in and in in another place one lady asked him how is it you have an impeccably good english accent and he was surprised why i should not have one <laughs> and then a couple of minutes later sridhar varaji comes on stage and oh that madam is the exponent of elizabeth and oratory and we humble people educated in english public schools can't speak like that he says and then he leaves that was in the middle of 1890 and he comes back to madras and in madras and bangalore in august and september respectively he recounts their campaigning experiences what happened in 1890 as also in 1888 was that when they went to campaign for india's political rights they were only invited by liberals they did not address gatherings even on one conservative platform the conservatives barred the doors in our faces he said once and when he came back to madras speaking in madras at the pachapaus hall he said he was so annoyed by the fact that the conservatives did not show even the least bit of interest in indian political reforms that he, he lambasted both the conservatives and the liberal unionists the liberal unionists were, were a set of people within the liberals who had separated away from the liberals and gave the conservatives the support though they did not join them in a formal coalition so as while speaking in madras uh, recounting the campaign experience someone had called the conservative the stupid party time has not loosened them from that reproach they have become stupider than ever he said and then he also uh, described the liberal unionists as monstrosities now at this time gopal krishna gokhale was a rising barrister and ri- rising congressman sorry rising congressman and uh, in later times he would become practically the leader of the moderates he was he was really annoyed by not on satirances from gokhale's point of view the indian congressman to, should strive to appeal to both the liberals and the conservatives and this kind of uh, this criticism from norton had the capacity of creating a party split in england and from gokhale's point of view the party split in england if it happens will not augur well for indian political aspirations so he wrote in sudarak criticizing norton's actions but norton spoke as one who was whose efforts to appeal to the conservatives had entirely failed i but what logoclay had pointed out was his tactical ineptitude and when the uh, in 1898 after the campaign in england for some reason which i don't know norton did not attend the congress in 1890 91 92 and 93 the next congress he attends was the congress of 1894 but uh, 1894 was a harrowing year for him he had got involved in an adulterous affair with the wife of a coffee planter in pu and that uh, devastated his political career he was compelled to resign the seat a newly won seat in the imperial council in calcutta uh, having been elected that too by the non official members of the madras legislative council that was in the former half of the of the year 1894 and uh, towards the end of the year there was stiff opposition from various quarters to his attendance and speaking at the madras congress but despite that the congressmen in madras were entirely in his favor so he was he was elected as a delegate and when the congress was in progress once again opposition came to speaking in the congress from the members of the what was called as a social purity movement first there was a subjection from a person called r venkatratnam and on the day when actually norton was asked to move a resolution objection came from a person called miss muller of the zenana mission both of them were not allowed by the president alfred bebb to move their amendments and they were not even allowed to speak and not to spoke he held the audience spellbound by a speech demanding the abolition of the india council in white hall the india council in white hall uh, policy advisers uh, and uh, they wielded enormous influence over indian affairs and not and wanted them abolished because they were spending huge sums of money at india's expense uh, there was then the drain theory propagated by dada banavarji not was one of the proponents of the drain theory he wanted the india council to be abolished and replaced by a committee of the house of commons so from his point of view the power centers then controlling india would be reduced from 3 to 2 namely the british parliament and the indian government the british government in india and if uh, indian affairs come directly under the purview of the british parliament he was uh, he found that a better option than this uh, this india council you know it's a spell binding speech if speech if you get an opportunity to read the entire text you must read it and uh, even after the end of this uh, congress the uh, this um, 
this rumpus that happened during the Congress continued to engage public attention. There were a lot of letters sent to newspapers. R. Venkat Ratnam and Ms. Mueller, who were, not, were denied the opportunity to speak at the Congress, ventilated their views by letters to the press which was published. And uh, the whole the lamentable series of events so affected Norton that a few months after the end of the 1894 Congress, he resigned from the International Congress, much to the disappointment of his many political admirers. He feared that uh, his political enemies were trying to use him as an excuse to injure the movement. And in later times, he gave freelance support to the Congress from outside. And he never reconsidered the decision. The only exceptional occasion when he attended the Congress gathering after this resignation in 1895 was the 1903 Madras Congress. He probably attended in deference to the request of his Congress friends in Madras. And even then, he only spoke on the first day in commendation of the President Lal Mohan Ghosh, who was the brother of Mona Mohan Ghosh, the Calcutta barrister I earlier referred. And by this time, by 1903, Mona Mohan Ghosh was already dead. And uh, Norton, while speaking in, uh, on, the on, on the first day, uh, in support of the proposal to amend Lal Mohan Ghosh as the President, recalled fond memories of his uh, dear departed friend. After the resignation in 1895, for a couple of years, Norton was in political wilderness. And then uh, he, uh, he entered politics once again, and though only local politics, by his election to the Madras Legislative Council in 1899. He was re-elected there to two years later, and then retired there from in 1903. And then a couple of years later, he moved to Calcutta. He lived in Madras only until November 1906. And he shifted his practice and residence to Calcutta. And uh, this was the time after the partition of Bengal in 1905. India was passing through a turbulent times, the Swadeshi years, and there were quite a number of revolutionary activities in Calcutta. And you all know the Alipur bomb case which went on in Calcutta from in 1908 to 1909. Norton led the prosecution. What is interesting is that who was once a liberal, who was once fighting for India's political rights against the British, now he was on the British side as a prosecutor for the Crown against the revolutionaries. Uh, when looked superficially, it might uh, appear as if he had undergone a transformation, as if there was an inconsistency, but no. He had always been, a, he never ceased to be a liberal. He had always been a liberal. He himself declared once that he was a liberal and a radical. And this uh, extremist revolutionary kind of patriotism was anathema to him. And uh, he always advocated the more liberal method and he was a supporter of the moderates method because moderates were only liberals. The word moderates and extremists were not really in vogue during the time when Norton was a member of the Congress because there were no extremists, there were no moderates. And later, those who were liberals became to be called moderates. The uh, Alipur bomb case, uh, after its conclusion, then he continued to live in Calcutta. And in the 1910s, he continued to give speeches, express his opinions, his views about the political developments that took place. He spoke about India's role in the First World War. And then in 1915, he uh, went to Ceylon, where martial law was proclaimed by Sir Robert Chalmers, the governor of Ceylon. And he went, went there to appear for the accused persons under trial. He went through a harrowing experience. It was quite a uh, disappointing experience for him. But at the time, he thanked that he lived in India. Little could he have known at the time that a, few, a couple of years later, the same experience would be uh, repeated in uh, the same experience will happen in the Punjab after the Jalian Balagar. That was in this uh, martial law incident was in 1915, and then after that, a few years later, the Home Rule movement was started by Annie Besant and Bal Gangadhar Tilak. Norton declared that he was not a votary of Home Rule. In fact, he even confessed that he could not understand what was meant by the term Home Rule. Some of them said, uh, the A.C. Majumdar once said that Home Rule, Swaraj or uh, uh, autonomous self, uh, autonomous uh, independence, whatever name you call it, meant the same thing. But from Norton's point of view, dominion, Home Rule was akin to Dominion Home Rule, as, uh, that in Ireland after the First World War. Although he was a supporter of uh, the demand for an increased share in self-government, by which uh, he meant an increased share, increased participation of Indians in the uh, administration of their own affairs. He was not really in favor of immediate home rule for India. 
he was all for uh, dominion home rule as an ultimate aim but uh, the demand for the granting of immediate home rule he was not in favor so he opposed that home rule demand and then uh, you all know in 1919 the jallian wala bag happened and then uh, martial law was proclaimed in the punjab and norton was denied the opportunity to go to the punjab to lahore to defend kalinath roy edit not edit of the tribune and that gave him a profound disappointment in fact uh, the series of events starting from the closing parts of 1918 until the middle of 19 1919 gave him a profound disappointment with the british statesmanship in india as it must have been as, uh, as it must have given disappointment to several others it was a decisive uh, shift in trend that period was in british indian history it was also the time one year later in 1920 The death of Bal Gangadhar Tilak literally coincided with the inauguration of the non-cooperation movement by Gandhi, and uh, Norton was uh, an opponent of this uh, Gandhi's methods. He fully appreciated Gandhi's sincerity, but he uh, vociferously criticized and denounced Gandhi's methods of non-cooperation, and he spoke and wrote about it quite often until the end. He, then after. Uh, 1920 he in 1920 he was elected by the non official europeans of madras to the central legislative assembly where his attendance was brief and then he went back to england on doctor's advice he started suffering something related to his head at the time he went he went to england on doctor's advice he returned to india he resigned his seat in the central legislative assembly and then he lived in retirement in kodaikanal for a couple of years and in may 1926 he left india and returned to england for good even at the time He, gave, he expressed his views about Indian affairs and uh, appealed to Indians to uh, not resort to such methods as non-cooperation. For from his point of view, cooperation was important because cooperation was key to implement the Mali Minto reforms, which uh, appeared in 1909, and then later the Montague Chemsford reforms, which came in 1919. To implement those reforms, cooperation was key. And uh, the vital difference between him and the extremists were the extremists were. Uh, impatient for change well because he was a liberal he uh, wanted change to come but gradually uh, and here once again it is necessary to remind ourselves of the words spoken by john bruce norton at the pachapas institution um, we must so time must ripe and posterity posterity must reap and that was the basis of norton's outlook towards early norton's outlook towards indian political reforms or aspirations having returned to england in may 1926 he lived uh, peacefully in kent for about two for for five years and breathed his last on 13th july 1931 and uh, for his services as a congressman he is remembered as one of india's greatest friends and uh, at the bar he was known and is remembered as perhaps the greatest advocate in jury trial advocacy uh, thank you very much